Hello. Okay, so this is a test for time and uh, either it'll help me keep within time or I will present well over time and I can use this as supplemental material. Either way, uh, I hope that this helps. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Bring up the slides and let's get started. Okay, so my name is Ken Rosenberg. I'm a PhD candidate in the media school and this presentation is called Morality in Media and Mind. This is not a comprehensive uh, discussion of anything. This is a review of some key bits of morality and psychology and media effects literature as it relates to supplemental class material for M213, Introduction to Media Psychology. So just some places where I can fill in the blanks with some things that I know about. And uh, there's, there's a rough through line. Uh, we'll start with um, higher level media effects about uh, creation, transmission, selection of media, um, why we believe certain things about the media we consume, why we consume media and how it reflects our beliefs, all of those sorts of things. Then delve deeper, explain a little bit about moral psychology um, and why we are built the way that we are, um, how we can recognize those things, why we know that that's how we are and what morality is from a biological and psychological and sociocultural level uh, and what we can do as media consumers and producers to thoughtfully um, utilize or even design different affordances and constraints and environments that directly correlate in a lot of ways to uh, pro-social outcomes, behaviors, um, that we can build the world we'd like to see, that if we're concerned about morality, uh, we can understand it at a more fundamental level of effects, causes, and then uh, ultimately changes. So let's start with gatekeeping and agenda setting. Why do we care about media uh, and why do we care about morality? Well, when it comes to research, we know that psychological mechanisms, you can't, you can lie on a survey. There's all sorts of reasons to do that. There's uh, uh, observation bias for starters, um, what you're willing to admit to yourself or what you're willing to recognize the depths of your ability to self-reflect. There's different scales for that. Um, that's its own independent variable. And so every time you conduct a survey, you have all of these barriers to getting at the truth of how people are making their decisions. Um, so instead, looking at uh, the underlying psychological mechanisms by doing behavioral tests or even better, uh, looking at psychophysiology to really understand what people are feeling in the moment where they make decisions uh, can, can help us better understand than simply inquiring about values and beliefs. And more importantly, as Haidt says about moral intuition, um, trying to convince someone of your opinion using facts and reason relates this to politics all the time. It's like trying to make a dog happy by wagging its tail. Um, you're looking to uh, affirm the antecedent, so to speak, by grabbing the tail and assuming that the dog is happy. And that's not how things work. It's actually more of a flow from emotion to reasons. And that's uh, what happens with morality and us as well. There's emotions and reason and morality is rampant everywhere. Um, when it comes to media, we all have all these sorts of moral panics. Uh, here's one, for example, that is very timely. I'm sure this speaks to you uh, in Bloomington with all of your bicycles. This series has been a big hit. And I decided to rename it That Age Poorly, How the News Covered the Future, Part 4, with Bicycle. This is the New York Times, 1894. 94. There has been a remarkable increase in the number of lunatics in England and Wales. Now, this points directly to bicycle riders. The habit of watching the revolution of the forward wheel develops in the mind of the bicycle rider a tendency to reason in a circle. Then again, the pneumatic tire, with its exasperating habit of bursting at unexpected moments, is little short of maddening in its effects. Men who are apparently mild clergymen or placid physicians will, when mounted on a bicycle, run down other men and women with 
without distinction and leave them dead or dying on the pavement. These bicyclists are on ordinary occasions men of humane impulses and correct conduct, but they are prey to that thirst for homicide, which habitual bicycling so commonly produces. This right. Uh, or just a whole slew of things across history. The, ki the kids are not all right headlines through history. There are the bicycles again. I think we've talked about comic books in previous weeks of class. I have not talked about pinball machines. We've talked about violence, but we haven't talked about addiction with television. Don't get me started. The kids are not all right. I grew up with dial-up. It did not interfere. Okay. So all sorts of reasons that people are concerned, all sorts of ways that society makes morality an issue, whether it's the moral content within the, uh, the, the thing or the medium itself and what it implies at this higher level, the round tires of the bicycle. Uh, Marshall McLuhan uh, in his medium theory would describe this effect that, you know, um, it's less about what you're doing on your phone and the idea that there's a whole campus full of people who are buried in their phones that really says something about the state of media right now in our society and what we do with it. And uh, so there's that aspect of morality and media. And at this higher level, you can see that when you're producing media, uh, there's the, the decisions you make are inherent. We're, we're inherently human. Uh, as Miguel Sicard says about ethics and video game play, there's no way to uh, extricate ethics from game design, even a game that is amoral uh, is choosing to be so, choosing to be so. Uh, the designers are choosing to make it that way. Uh, and so everything that we do as ethical beings has ethical consequences. And so presumably when you, uh, Kurt Lewin, when he established the gatekeeping theory, um, pointed out that uh, you know people need to make choices. There are, there's only so much space on the front page of the newspaper. There's only so many headlines. There's only so many talking points that can happen on Capitol Hill that people are willing to include in their voting, in their everyday debates and discussions around the dinner table. There's just a certain limit to these things for lots of uh, financial and even cognitive reasons that limit these things. And so there just has to be a selection. And what do you choose? You don't choose cat gets rescued from a tree today. You do focus on wars at home, then wars at abroad, you know, and, and, and there's sort of a priority list. Um, there's, there's just an inevitability of what we select and who is doing the selecting has a lot to do with how things are reflected. Um, so there's all sorts of framing that also happens when it comes to this. And framing is a second level effect of agenda setting. So agenda setting theory is that the media doesn't necessarily, uh, this is after bullet theory, which was debunked by the way, some of you in your exams tried to leverage bullet theory like it was an actual thing. Um, Agenda setting theory is, uh, states that the media, you know, it concedes a little bit and says the media can't tell us what to think, but it can certainly tell us what to think about. And so because of the gatekeeping effect, we have this agenda setting theory that states that the media is very good. And we can see this reflected in the literature that um, the things that are presented in the news or the things that people self-report are the most salient issues of the day. There's some variance more and more today with uh, siloing and self-selection and echo chambers um, and media literacy. Uh, but generally speaking, people are aware of what the agenda is. And it's very hard, even as a news producer, they lament um, in, in talks that it's, uh, it's difficult to shift the agenda um, because there's so much pressure from producers and, and a need to be uh, breaking edge on the same thing that your competitors are doing. So, um, but it's a uh, second level agenda setting is about framing and framing is again, uh, not just 
telling us what to think about, but how to think about it. And they can't make us think that, but they can make something salient to us. They can set the agenda, and then they can also make a frame salient around those things. And that's with word choice and other sorts of things. Um, you can see here uh, the difference between how people of different race are covered uh, following the disaster in, with Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. And you know, if you go to the same grocery store, say, and you're foraging for supplies, you might be seen finding or looting. Uh, and these frames fit a lot of what we talked about earlier with crime and morality. Um, but here it's just an A-B comparison. Um, Another thing that's really important to talk about with morality and media is that a lot of the time we seek out things that are not necessarily moral. Um, there's reasons for conformity. There's a really cool study about lines and group decision. You can put one person in a room with full of Confederates and have them agree that a line that is obviously shorter than the other one is the longest line in the, in the set that they're all staring at. Conformity is a hell of a thing. It doesn't happen with everyone, but you can make it happen in a lab setting. People are willing to go there. If there's enough tilt in the room uh, that people go past their tipping point and sort of uh, relinquish their sense of moral agency, that's something that Albert Bandura talks about. He's the guy who created social learning theory, remember Bobo Um, So uh, another reason is anchoring effect and bias, that um, the second you hear something from a certain perspective or if you're coming from a certain place with your own beliefs, if I tell you, you know, uh, how old uh, do you think I am right now? Uh, I could be 50 or five. Right now, you're not going to tell me that I'm 34, which I actually am. You're going to lean more in a direction that you're not going to say 50 because I don't necessarily look 50, please, hopefully. Uh, but you might say, you know, 38 or something. You might skew higher than what you might normally think. Um, just because I give you a number first, the number doesn't have to be related to anything. There's all sorts of really cool um, research on this, even in the industry, I'm really fascinated by the anchoring effect when it comes to video game scores, review scores, um, where, you know, they're definitely afraid that you're going to see a number and judge the experience accordingly, because psychological literature shows that you will. Um, so don't spoil a game for yourself, by the way, but that's a whole other. Uh, the other reason to, uh, you got to skip your foot in the door, you can look it up. It's another fun persuasion technique, but all these things happen. And we kind of like them and we're kind of susceptible to them. Uh, the biggest example of the nexus of that would be the Dunning-Kruger effect, or uh, also kind of related to the illusion of explanatory depth. Uh, you can see how, um, Basically, the less you know, the the more blind spots you have. You're you're less you're more confident in what you know because you don't really know what you don't know, um, and so you think you have a better beat on the world because why shouldn't you? You know most of the things that you know, and the things that you don't know aren't important, and so on and so forth. And um, it's there's an. Uh, <laughs> So, so uh, it's very, you can be very susceptible to uh, just hearing the same talking points over and over, uh, regardless of your normal level of information, you can, you can convince yourself that you're uh, pretty aware of everything that's going on. Uh, and the illusion of explanatory depth, you actually probe people who have strong policy beliefs, uh, strong political values, you can see that there's not a lot of factual depth that drives those motivations. They might be able to research that and defend it when asked and pressed, but generally speaking, that those aren't the facts that drive their beliefs. They're usually more uh, tribal, and we'll come back to that word in a little bit. Uh, but you can see the headline here across these slides is that the lie is the point. Uh, when I say that morality influences media, here's something that was put out by, I think it was the Washington Post. Um, and, uh, they, they surveyed people and with some of the questions they asked at the bottom of the screen, uh, you know, which inauguration is this, you know, which event is, it, you know, do you know what this is, and then uh, you could ask which photo has more people, sometimes they just ask which photo has more people. And uh, it's very obvious what the factual truth of this picture is that we're not even debating what the rate of GDP growth is or something abstract like that something something with nuance is it right to value make something illegal prescribe something we're not going there it's just what do you see in this picture and um, because people 
who are uh, political extremists know, are very familiar with each of these photos and know which event uh, belongs to whom uh, and, and knows which inaugural event had fewer people. Um, sometimes the Trump supporters will recognize that photo A is of their president's inauguration and will choose to say that that photo has more people uh, as a political statement, um, which is interesting. Even if you know that that's wrong, uh, the fact that you're willing to signal that um, says something. And this is an anonymous survey um, and it's on a website that in, might engender that sort of response from some of its audience members anyway, but um, that's it's it's an interesting thing that people will choose to do, and you can see that here uh, that Trump voters percent wrong answer which photo is from which inauguration, which one has more people. It all goes down tremendously, and you can see the non-voters don't know which is which. <laughs> <laughs> the third line on that first graph, there, you know, uh, but when you get to the second one, which one has more people, uh, even the non-voters know what's up, uh, but the Trump voters will remain strong a little bit, and there's a contingency there that doesn't want to shift. It's about contesting fact. It's not necessarily about gathering fact or presenting fact. Sometimes we're looking for specific morals from our media. And why? Well, we have motivated reasoning. Um, people know which photo actually has more people, but there's all sorts of reasons to motivate people. Well, I'm gonna signal this anyway. Well, I'm gonna mess up the results of the survey and show them that science is bunk. Uh, or, you know, uh, the more literal application of motivated reasoning is where you start to say, well, you know, you can't see the people in the background. And, you know, he really did say that that was a bad, you know, that, that was earlier in the day and it got bigger or the crowd dispersed earlier, or whatever he said, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, um, can't keep track of that. Uh, but, but there's all sorts of motivated reasoning that occurs when people choose to accept certain facts over others. Um, there's selective exposure. Um, so the photos, the, there might've been talk all day that helps you with that motivated reasoning. Um, and you can, uh, there's a really great experiment that, that shows that we're willing to tune out things that we don't care about and we're very willing to tune in things that we do care about. So um, anti-smoking and anti-Christian, if you brought someone in who was a smoker or a Christian, vice versa, uh, if, the, if it was relevant to you to hear that uh, it's okay to be a smoker, you don't have to quit, or, you know, it's terrible to be a Christian or a Christianity will save you from smoking, whatever, the, the things that al aligned with your beliefs, the things, you know, if, if you could tune in to something that said, it's okay to keep smoking, um, you will hold down the button to reduce the static a little bit. You only have a certain amount to do that, but you'll do that and, and turn your attention and your uh, limited resource of static reduction towards that. Um, and it drives news consumption on Facebook, which we already know. Uh, see, it's, it's all about these groups. Uh, this guy, Boyer, I cited in this Atlantic article. Atlantic? Yeah, Atlantic article. Okay. Um, uh, makes the case that it's, uh, it's more useful in society to know which side your community members are on than it is to debate facts that don't really matter. So agreeing that you have the same God is more important. No. Sorry, agreeing that the crops will grow together is more important, but agreeing which God is superior or more valid or something like that does help with knowing that let's say when the crops run fallow, there's something bad uh, in the environment, there's war from the outside, there's uh, some sort of famine or illness, you know who's going to help your child, you know who's going to defend your family, you know who's going to migrate with you, who's going to share the resources. Um, it's about signaling tribalism. It's whether or not they're prepared to side with you. And uh, that's why Fox News admits, even when they're pressed in lawsuits, that it, it doesn't matter if they're stating the truth or not. In fact, we know that they're not. The legal argument to get Tucker Carlson out of litigation is to say that anybody who believes what he says should be 
uh, laughed at a little bit, that we all know that that he's lying, that it's that's not what he's doing. He's giving, um, he's he's providing entertainment. And, and so this is about establishing moral tribes and how we belong to these certain things, how sometimes what we're looking at of media or to get out of media is exactly what we want to put into it. Um, and because of things like parasocial interaction, remember sending that meme out a few weeks ago, um, you know, these people, these faces that we see become our faces, our friends, our tribe. And when they tell us that something is wrong, um, we don't have to necessarily believe the facts behind it. We just need to agree with them that it is wrong. Um, so when people say that um, that we need to find common ground on both sides, I would say that right now, um, the cruelty is the point, as it says here, that we know that Facebook algorithms um, are causing people to be enraged, that the more we connect about our beliefs, the more we have disagreements, uh, the more we expose polarization on one side, we see an equal amount of polarization and enragement. Um, Paul Bloom, who researches empathy, argues that, and altruism and other things about moral behavior, uh, argues that uh, when it comes to dehumanization, a lot of cognitive scientists like to let uh, people off the hook, so to speak, and uh, remove their sense of responsibility. Bandura talks about the um, uh, disengagement of moral age, selective engagement and disengagement of moral agency. People talk about the size of the amygdala and innate sensibilities of empathy and capacity for self-perception and reflection, uh, mirror neurons, the whole thing. And Bloom says, it actually requires a lot of humanization to dehumanize someone. It takes a lot of knowing what someone is to bully them effectively, to tear them down. Uh, that it takes a lot of acknowledgement of someone's humanity to strip it away from them. Uh, and that it, empathy can actually be the source of a lot of cruelty. That it's people's capacity to understand the pain that someone is experiencing that for some people, motivates them to engage in the suffering of others. Um, sometimes we really do understand what's happening and we're okay with it because we are upholding the tribe. So the question is why, on, on what values? Where do we put people on tribes? We don't live in older times. You know, we, <laughs> we live in, uh, we live in a, in a connected society that is not bound by geography. You might have something more in common with you with a weird selective group of people um, from across the globe, from many different places. And I say weird, there's actually an acronym for that, but in that case, I just meant you might be an eclectic group of folks uh, who have some affinity for some media property or some identity as an individual or some political cause that uh, can be gathered together. That's one of the benefits and also the really harsh detriments of social media and our new global village, as Marshall McLuhan calls it. Um, but we have tribes that are atypical. What organizes us these days in our ad hoc online affinity spaces, as James Paul G calls them in video game literature? And uh, moral psychologist Jonathan Haidt says that it's these values here on these spectrums, and you can we'll talk about these graphs a little bit later, um, that uh, explain just, uh, just how we have our differences when it comes to at least di disagreements in Western societies, particularly the United States. That's one of my many critiques about moral foundations theory, but uh, it's still a very compelling framework. So uh, let's relearn what you've learned a little bit, let go, uh, feel, don't think, use your instincts. If we're gonna understand what morality is, why we choose those different things, and why we engage with uh, moral media the way we do through all those different processes and effects I mentioned earlier, then we should really understand the mechanisms that create moral decision-making in the first place. Um, 
So uh, there are some problems. If you look at traditional ethical philosophy or some of the early literature in uh, social science and learning and education, uh, you can see that they talk about different hierarchies of ethics and different uh, lawnmowers outside and uh, diff uh, that when you have your Maslow's hierarchy of needs satisfied, you'll probably go up the Kohlbergian uh, progression of ethics, especially as you age into different groups and learn different dynamics. And all of those things are generally true on an observable level, but they don't answer a lot of other kinds of problems. So you can survey people, you can observe their behavior, you can sort of uh, ask outside the black box, so to speak, um, but if you really want to understand from a more behavioral perspective, or even a more cognitive or physiological perspective, there are things going on uh, that we know from other kinds of experiments that underlie those kinds of uh, moral reasons and moral expressions that we give on the outside. So one of them is the dual process problem. We know that people reason about things and we can ask them about their rationales, but typically, um, and this goes into the uh, motivated reasoning problem, the things that they state are the reasons they did something are typically not the reasons that they actually did something. Uh, in fact, you can find people making things up later, which is kind of the post hoc problem, um, to the point where uh, it's really interesting, you can uh, give people these moral dilemmas and ask them for their decision uh, in a lab, give them a little text vignette of what an issue might be and see if they agree or disagree that this is a problem. And when they say, yes, it's a problem, and you ask them, please tell me why, they actually start making up extra details that were not in the story you gave them um, that, that work within the story, you know, that know that there were three things on the table, there were four. Uh, you told me that someone would see them and it was actually private. I'm like, no, no, it was private. There were only two, whatever it is. It's, uh, it's not really a problem in any other way. And they say, I don't know, it's still a problem. Um, and that's a really good demonstration of someone's ability to not be able to give you that post hoc reasoning. Um, but typically moral reasoning serves as a post hoc explanation. Um, we see that there's some sort of deeper intuition that's driving decisions. And then we have reasons uh, and, and our reasoning typically engages afterward. Um, that's the post hoc thing. Uh, and that even while we're making decisions, there's sort of this intuitive process going on. And that at the end of the day, all of those things at the intuitive level uh, describe our actions, our behaviors far better than, um, than what we might say at the end of the day. Um, so while traditional morality looks a little bit like this, where we feel something, but really, the first solid line we have is towards reasoning and then we judge something, but there's kind of this other process going there first called affect, but we don't really think it's solidly connected even though it comes first. And at the same time that we start engaging our reasoning and sort of an underlying cognitive system that we have, and we'll get to that. Um, but anyway, so Haidt refutes that rightfully and says that moral intuitionism is it's an important definition here. The sudden conscious appearance of a moral judgment, including an affective valence, good, bad, like, dislike, it's just that gut feeling. We all know what that is, typically, without any conscious awareness of having gone through steps of searching, weighing evidence, or inferring a conclusion. Now, the thing, the situations where we feel this moral intuition might be different. We might be uh, more morally sensitive in some situations than other people. We might have certain values that make our moral sensibilities uh, become more salient and, and, and uh, powerful to us um, in certain social situations where other people might feel uh, more morally sensitive. In other situations, the values that you ascribe to certain things might be culturally relative, and we'll get into that, but generally speaking, um, at the end, uh, at the, the bottom of the levels of abstraction that is uh, morality, what happens in your brain is that you have something quickly happen that is affective, that is uh, built by or motivated by emotion, that leans in a dualistic way toward good, bad, that helps you make a judgment. So it's when, what is morality? Is it this divine thing? Uh, a lot of us these days believe that morality starts with gut reactions. Um, and you can see this laid out here. Height 2001 is a really great read. I don't have the time to get into it, except to say that uh, we now know 
uh, or most of us operate within this new moral intuitionist paradigm uh, that believes that intuitive judgment comes first. And then we start engaging with a conscious judgment and uh, then those things help us build some reasoning. But you can see that there's a line from A's judgment to B's intuition, such that sometimes uh, before your reasoning even comes out, before you can explain something to someone, you're already uh, giving them some sort of feedback non-verbally that's helping them think about how you think about a thing, which helps them think about the thing itself. And in other words, sometimes uh, you're not even done making up your mind before someone else is influencing you on how to make it up, especially at the conscious level. So there's this reciprocal loop uh, between ourselves as moral agents and also a little bit uh, between ourselves that dotted line six represents reflection and um, sometimes Jonathan Hyde says, you know, you can go back and revisit your judgment, your intuition, uh, but it's, it's rare, it takes a lot of effort, it usually takes at the very least multiple instances uh, to occur. So not only do you not wanna uh, wag the dog, like we said in the earlier metaphor, uh, but you, in order to do it right, you need to pet the dog more than once. Okay, so um, what is moral intuition? Well, we know that it's automatic of effective and dualistic. That is to say that we know it's a gut reaction, it's emotional, and it's good, bad. Uh, you can show people stories where you explain that uh, two siblings decide to uh, have sex on, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not, it's just dry. That's, it's a good time to get choked up. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, two siblings decide to uh, sexually engage with each other on a weekend. They use protection. There's no risk of anybody knowing. Uh, they're never going to do it again. And there's all sorts of details that make it okay, but everybody feels like it's not okay, especially in more Western societies. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Susan uses her flag, she hangs it every day, she folds it in bad weather, she's loved it respectfully, but it's gotten a little bit weathered over the years, so she cuts up her flag into pieces, uh, you know, she hangs up a new one, but she takes the old one, doesn't want to waste things, wants to be an environmentalist, cuts it up, uh, uses it as rags to clean her bathroom floor, and, uh, you know, do you think that's wrong? And people who have a strong sense of loyalty will probably say, yeah, there's something wrong about that, even though technically she did everything right, but you're supposed to burn it, right? There's something respectful about it, even though it's not endangering another human being. That's where all these stories come in. And so the final one, not endangering another human being, but is, you know, John's a very upstanding citizen, pays his taxes, works really hard, everybody likes him. Every Friday, he takes some of his paycheck, goes to the grocery store, buys a whole chicken, um, goes home, closes all the shades, uh, uh, uses all sorts of protection, but uh, has sex with the chicken, uh, cooks the chicken thoroughly. Anything that was involved in the sex is burned away. It's safe to eat. There's no, and, and, and he doesn't share it with anyone and he never tells anybody, uh, but it's just something he does. Is that wrong, morally speaking? And everybody just says, Yes, and you're all nodding. Yes, oh my God, ah, yeah. Um, so we know that there's something that uh, goes beyond care and harm was Haidt's initial argument, that there are more foundations. Um, there's more to this philosophy than was dreamt of in Western literature. So there's a lot of loyalty and authority and social rules that people respect just as much as physical rules of care and equality. Um, the other thing we know is that it's uh, based on our interactions with environmental stimuli, it's evolved, and I'll mention that a little bit later, but that means that we can sort of piggyback these different effects back and forth, which is really interesting. So uh, if you offer people hand sanitizer as a door prize uh, in a political, uh, after taking a bunch of political questionnaires, they're more likely to select that hand sanitizer uh, instead of the erasers or the pencils or whatever other door prizes you offer them because answering the things politically makes you, it activates your sense of disgust, makes, uh, 
may, uh, primes your foundation of moral purity and actually makes you want to wash your hands a little bit. Uh, it's interesting too that when you place a hand sanitizer stand like is pictured here on the slide in the corner of the room and then just ask people to answer political questions, they skew a little bit more conservatively than the groups that did not receive the hand sanitizer sitting in the corner of the room. So it's called the Macbeth effect because you want to wash your hands of the disgusting, repugnant situation that is plaguing your mind. So we know that things that are socially disgusting are uh, potentially as maladaptive as things that are physically disgusting, that uh, a rotting group can be as bad as a rotting fruit. So uh, the other thing we know is about coordination, and I just don't have time to get into that right now. You can look at these slides later. So um, moral foundations theory piggybacks on moral intuitionism, uh, piggybacks on it, it, it extends it. Um, Heights mentor Schweder uh, was an anthropologist who derived the three ethics through observation. So he said these these three universal cross cultural, um, re regardless of background or level of technology, kind of just universal to all human groups. Three ethics, which are uh, autonomy and community, sort of this uh, higher level tension that's negotiated by divinity. So autonomy, community, divinity. Some people talk about just autonomy and community, but I think all three are important. I think divinity is the self of conscious that we have, conscience that we have that sort of uh, um, encourages debate, uh, uh, negotiates the tension between those two things. Divinity is the, well, we'll get to it. Okay. So the idea is that we have these moral modules. Um, for Schwader, it was, uh, autonomy, community, divinity, for height, it's these other things, but instead of uh, making observations, height goes further and issues a massive survey. And so through a questionnaire and some factor analysis, derives five factors instead of three ethics and says that um, moral intuitions are instant and adaptive. Um, he initially asked 3,000 people, and then you get this really cool line crossing interaction effect. When you ask 30,000 people, I'll explain the interaction effect. Um, and Haydn Joseph explained uh, in 2009 that the, um, the reason we see political differences, so they sort of introduced this theory, uh, not just as here's what morality is across these five domains, but also as a, did you ever wonder why? And here's the answer to why we have such a political divide in a way that goes beyond facts. So linking this to earlier, understanding why we choose a Tucker Carlson or a Rachel Maddow or a whoever, um, regardless of facts, why do we choose them? Uh, here's the reason, here's some of the reasons behind that. Here's the emotions and the, how they lead to particular values. Um, and then, those represent the types of tribes that we find and the people that we respect within those tribes. So he says the moral intuitions are evolved and adapted. I, I already mentioned disgust, which is over there next to sanctity degradation, sometimes known as purity sanctity, it changes. Um, but what, what's really important here on this slide is that you notice that uh, there's some sort of challenge. You know, we, we needed to avoid uh, rotten food, but we also needed to avoid, uh, avoid people polluting the group. Um, loyalty, we needed to form coalitions. So obviously things that challenge the group uh, might be the original trigger. There might be some sort of warring tribe, but now there, there are current triggers, right? We can, uh, there, we, have, we have these vestigial reasons, but we have these modern affordances. And so we sort of uh, enjoy them or exercise them through things like sports teams and uh, nationalism. Sometimes it gets, dangerous nationalism is still uh, highly problematic. As, as someone who studies games and play, I think sports teams are a great way to channel one sense of loyalty and betrayal. Um, and obviously, um, sometimes we really care about cartoon characters or fictional characters um, when really those sorts of caring traits that the thing that makes them cute, the reason that we would follow them and put their pictures up on the wall would traditionally be that they uh, belong to our village or they are of our kin and that we would be caring for them. And so there's all sorts of things that we do that are moral 
in a certain way towards media content out there in the world that is uh, really driven by more instinctual needs as social beings. Um, what's really interesting though is that when you talk about people who are more uh, liberal in the, in the Western sense, so I'll say progressive, uh, instead of liberal, because that has a lot of different connotations. I don't mean libertarian or liberal in that, in that capital L sense, but when you're more politically progressive versus politically conservative, you tend to prize care and fairness to a very high degree, uh, but in collectivist cultures and in the conservative parts of our Western society, you can find that the more conservative you get, you care about all five foundations more equally that uh, being loyal to one's family is just as important as uh, care. So you might make your child do something that they would consider to be suffering or oppressive, but you think is right to uphold the family's honor. Um, that's more acceptable in collectivist and conservative societies. And when you get to be very conservative as an individual, your responses might change uh, and intersect such that um, being conservative means that you prize those things over uh, care and equality. And this is also reflected when you survey people and ask what kind of dog they would like or what kind of pet they would like. Do they want one that's really cuddly and compassionate? Do they want one that's obedient and loyal? And you can see people with political persuasion sort of leaning on average in different directions toward desiring a pet that uh, reflects their own personal values. Uh, again, this is related to Schwader's autonomy, community, divinity. There's also another theory, uh, I think it's anthropology, uh, called relational models theory, uh, that talks about four ways that people manage uh, authority, power, ranking, and share resources with each other. It's very similar to the levels of, in a, in a Kohlberg, like progression of values and behaviors kind of way, is very similar to the progression of uh, the moral foundations, the communal sharing is very similar to caring, authority ranking is very close to authority and loyalty, equality matching is kind of like fairness, you know, market pricing is this sanctity, it's like the, it's like divinity, it's like this, um, it's, it's a thing that actually makes morality uh, construed in this way, uniquely human. All these other things that aren't underlined, um, so sanctity and a few other th things on the foundations, but divinity and market pricing, these are the things that allow us for, uh, allow us to conduct meta level negotiation. They allow us to, these are the things that allow us to develop like fiat currencies and uh, abstractions of trade and uh, think about long-term relationships when it comes to sharing resources and negotiating norms. These are the reasons that we like to punish people um, and, and even in economics games, we'll spend our own money to punish people with no benefit to ourselves, just to signal to the group that it is wrong for that person to do that, to uphold group norms. Uh, we can see people doing this at cost to themselves. Uh, and it's that sort of reflection on what's right and wrong and our ability to police it, to go back to Betsy's talk about uh, policing with morality and how uh, there's an important social component to the uh, to the element of displaying justice in the news, um, that's that's one of the ways that morality is uniquely human. Um, one of the ways that morality intersects with media effects research is effective disposition theory. Disposition theory goes way back uh, to Zillman and Cantor in the '70s, but Art Rainey over at what is that UCF UF. Uh, you can look him up, he's, he's cool, uh, does research on disposition theory in relation to media enjoyment and moral judgment more specifically. Uh, the general, the gist of this is that we like good guys to be rewarded, we like bad guys to be punished, we appreciate the journey of anti-heroes from being good to, uh, from bad to good. Um, you know, uh, the, when you say, oh, that character, they've done too much, they can't turn to the light side now, they've got to die, or they can turn, but right before the end, and they have to die before the end of the movie. When you think in those sorts of ways, you're recognizing the scripts that media producers leverage to create stories that are, uh, at least in Western cultures, considered to be 
uh, pleasing in a f uh, formulaic sense, but still very uh, archetypal. Um, there's plenty of other uh, cinema out there, plenty of other narrative uh, forms of media storytelling that uh, where the endings are more ambiguous. Uh, you can think of Pan's Labyrinth and how that was uh, brought over here, but not as well received because what happens? Um, you know, people need to know if the top of an inception stops spinning. Um, and there are things that don't necessarily end with, or have three acts or end with a specific arc. You can look at Japanese storytelling for that too. There's a lot of there's there's a lot of examples. Um, I went just understanding the different uh, production cues for what signals good and bad. It's usually uh, certain actions. So you know they didn't just rob the bank. They kidnapped the old lady who was trying to cross the street, or the little girl. Uh, they slapped the candy out of her hand, and we know that this guy isn't just a crook. He's a thug, or he's a, he's a bad person. Um, another way to do this traditionally, especially with older media, was to rely on racist cues. Uh, so here you can see a Star Trek original series Klingon in what is essentially blackface. Um, it, there have been many attempts in the future to expand on this and, and make the Klingons uh, a bit more of a culturally inclusive element of Star Trek, including adding facial ridges, but um, the the it, there are still problems. Um, here you can see as well, before there was any sort of facial ridges or if some of you might have seen Klingons that look a little less human than this, uh, you, there's this mustache that's kind of known as a Fu Manchu mustache, which is terrible. Um, it's, it's sort of meant to emphasize some uh, Asian caricatures. I think this character might be Kang, I don't remember. In particular, there's a few that sound sort of similar to that. A lot of Klingon names sound very much alike. That's something else that's problematic. Um, but you can see that there's a leverage of uh, dark brown skin, but also uh, Asian facial features with the with the added facial hair. And it's um, and he belongs to a thieving, cheating, conniving, warlike race that refuses to join the the United Nations like Federation of Planets. So we know that they're always the bad guys and we know that we can enjoy when they're bad. You can think of uh, the, the cliche phrase, mustache twirling villains, the cartoon villain Snidely Whiplash, uh, who ties, uh, oh, what's her face? And Dudley do right to the train tracks. And it's so, yeah, um, it's so stereotypical. Um, but these are the sorts of stereotypes that are leveraged. and. Uh, whether it's this uh, in the 60s or today, uh, you know, the Bond villains have changed. They've gone through many different looks, but they're sort of critique of recent Bond films for having um, Middle Eastern young male actors uh, promoting some sort of tech or financial scheme. And that's, how to, that's a trope uh, that would fit within this model. Um, and so anyway, so they would say that the, that it's not just that this is how we judge media, but this is uh, how we derive our enjoyment from it, not just determine whether or not we like the movie, but the reason we watch the movie is to watch the good guy get the bad guy before the end scene and for the bad guy to go, oh, no, and we love the moment where someone is arrested or whatever it is. Um, beyond simply enjoying the justice of something, sometimes we might want to reflect on something. We might engage with suffering on purpose. There's no greater movie that exemplifies this than one of the number one ranked, I don't know if it's Rotten Tomatoes or IMDb, but when you search top rated movies, uh, and this is more by users than critics, uh, it's, you know, it used to be free on cable before everybody cut the cord. Sometimes you might sit down for a weekend and watch with 80 commercials, the Shawshank Redemption. And, uh, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but you can just tell by the poster. I think the word that comes to mind is vindication, right? Uh, fear can hold you prisoner, hope can set you free. So it's all about being uh, free from your own fear, not being a prisoner anymore. We know that Shawshank is a prison. You don't have to know anything else about this story to know what that feeling is. So you're going to spend a lot of time at Shawshank and then there will be some sort of redemption. 
And so people are here to stimulate their own reflective thoughts. What would I do in this, uh, in this situation myself? And I'm so glad I don't have this suffering in my own life. And I'm so grateful for the things that I have. Uh, this is sort of beyond hedonism. It's about appreciation. There's this deeper sense of audience response, or maybe you're seeking not just moral virtue, but elevation not just uh, exemplifying good values, but overcoming overwhelming bad values. And so you're willing to subject yourself, kind of like horror movies with the catharsis that comes later. Uh, you're willing to suffer through the pursuit of happiness or the Shawshank Redemption or uh, these other movies that sort of uh, exemplify suffering with the payoff that you get the relief of the protagonist at the end. Uh, you get this cathartic um, sense of meaning Basically, you, you get this, uh, this vicarious experience that allows you to, uh, trans to question maybe, but then to transcend your own moral state. Um, but we know that you can't really transcend your own moral state for too long uh, when it comes to video games uh, or soap operas. So Eden, this first study talks about repeated exposure to soap operas. If we show you a soap opera, uh, once a week, let's say we took our Thursday lecture and instead of lecturing, we just showed you an episode of the same soap opera. But first, we gave you a uh, pre-test questionnaire. So week zero, we ask you, we give you a bunch of questionnaires that measure your moral foundation salience, those different values that we looked at earlier, care and purity. See where you rank on those things with your own personal expressions. Um, and then we have you watch one episode every week for eight for half the semester. We survey you again, on average, if there's a shift in your moral salience, it will be in alignment with the values that we code from the content of the show. Um, so audiences really do gravitate in certain directions. Uh, and then those, those media content uh, create certain types of audiences as well. So uh, the soap opera study, and then also uh, Boy and Grizzard, if you survey people who played through Mass Effect 1, you can find uh, sort of pseudo experimental post hoc results, uh, where basically if you ask people what uh, they chose to, to be, to perform as in their first playthrough, either a paragon, a good guy, or a, a renegade, sort of a bad guy, but a, or an anti-hero, um, you'll find that they, end up choosing a uh, hero more often than not, which uh, especially, uh, which correlates with their uh, likelihood to choose the progressive values of care and fairness. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if they are more, um, uh, if they are less group binding and more individualist and equality promoting, uh, then they will engage in that way with the game. And if they're more about controlling people, then they will be a renegade and they will control people in the game. Um, which is why I think it's a little idealistic for effective disposition theory to say, well, we love good, we love good guys and we love, we hate it when bad guys get rewarded. And it's as simple as that. We know that a lot of people liked Joker, a lot of people rep Slytherin, um, it's, it's a real phenomenon. And moral foundations theory similarly agrees that, you know, we love when people uphold these moral virtues, says Ron Tamburini, and we hate, uh, we have a negative effective response to their thwarting. Um, so when someone betrays someone, we don't like it. And we only like it when someone is loyal to someone, unless there's some other factor, and then it's unfalsifiable and it all explains itself away, but that's a whole other discussion. I'm here to say right now in this moment, Something that's really important is that uh, sometimes people just have bad personality traits, antisocial personality traits. So um, narcissism, Machiavellianism, psychopathy, things that are objectively problematic, especially if they define one's personality, uh, do correlate to preferences and affinities for villainous characters in popular media. So your friend that says, yeah, I'm a Slytherin, come at me, like maybe don't, maybe miss them and uh, go find some new friends because they are who they say they are. Sometimes it's not just an act. Uh, the team jersey that you wear does tend to say something about who you are. 
Um, and furthermore, I just think it's a little bit ridiculous from an evolutionary standpoint. I call this the Han Solo effect. Uh, here's an example of someone who violates each of these foundations in a way that we find endearing, not just because of the arc that he takes, but in the moment themselves, we find them entertaining and we find them respectable. We don't necessarily like that he's chosen to be a rogue, but we know that as a rogue, the values that he chooses and the decisions that he makes as a result of choosing those values really does have a degree of uh, tautological respectability to it, such that if you are going to choose to be on your own, you really don't need to engage in these group norms. You can look out for yourself because you're not volunteering to look out for anyone else. So when he says, what's in it for me, we kind of know that's a valid question because we understand that's how he operates. We know that he cheats because he's looking out for himself. We see him betray people multiple times, but we understand it's because he's looking out for himself. We see him violate authority, but we know that he's upholding his sense of self. Um, and here he's uh, engaging in, in impure things. His hands are dirty, if you remember the lines from the movie. And here he's being strung up. Um, and these are things that are potentially degrading in a moral sense. Um, but we love him for this and his ability to carry these things with grace because he's not there to uphold the sanctity of the church. Uh, he's there to look out for himself. And we get that. Um, so I really think that these foundations, you look at Superman as a, as a uh, counterbalancing example, you can actually, we, we typically, even if we uh, understand these things, we don't necessarily like them. We would rather him, uh, we would rather that he is loyal to Luke. We would rather that his hands, that he washed his hands before he starts making out with Leia. He's got, she's got that white sweater, that cream colored sweater. That's not good. Um, we'd like, that he doesn't have to cheat to get to survive or to do what he needs to do. But we understand these things. Uh, we normally prefer that he would care, be loyal, but you can actually care and be so loyal that it's kind of obnoxious, that it's actually a fatal flaw. If you look at the superhero uh, Superman, he's sort of criticized for not having enough weaknesses and beyond kryptonite, most of the time the writers find that his weaknesses are his upstanding character or his inability to be in two places at once, but that's a different. Um, so we see that he's so caring that it's actually kind of painful how much he's willing to sacrifice himself um, and, and put himself literally under in harm's way. Um, he's so fair um, that it, it's the reason that Lex Luthor keeps going in and out of jail. He's so loyal um, that he gives everybody a second chance. He's so obedient uh, that he often gets used. That's the plot of Superman Returns, I, th I think. <laughs> uh, and he's so pure that he's almost naive. Batman calls him a Boy Scout. And, you know, he gets away with it because he's pretty much omnipotent. Um, but without that kind of power, someone who is just a mere mortal would be crushed under the social weight of doing all of those things. You would be shot. You would be in debt with someone else's credit. You would be um, just the, you, you would be uh, not your own person. You would be a servant to other people. You need to uphold your sense of self in order to be a moral person as well. Um, point being, I think everybody learns in both directions. So to really understand that, uh, there's some great videos online. You can look them up. Paul Bloom, Infant Studies, Yale, infant study and you can see um, that we do need to uphold the self and the group and we learn these things at a very early age um, this infant is being shown stuffed animals uh, and the rabbits are either kicking the ball back or keeping the ball for themselves it's, it's a puppet show I'm, I'm personifying them on purpose i suppose because that's what the baby is seeing in fact you can even take shapes just like triangles and squares on a screen. If you put eyeballs on them, infants are still able to understand them as moral agents who help and hinder each other get up and down a hill. So there's all sorts of ways that they show uh, infants agents that make decisions and they typically choose uh, to maintain eye contact with, reach for, to grab and play with, uh, take treats from the rabbit that was more helpful than not. So uh, Paul Bloom and others find that there's sort of this pre-wiring that we have. So even before we start developing values or really 
how our culture, our family is going to decide our moral foundation salience or anything like that, that underneath all of that, we have this built-in desire to be nice and to like things and other agents that are nice to other people, um, that we appreciate fairness and that we have a certain sense of justice. Now, when I say pre-wiring for fairness, um, you can ask a, a toddler, you know, uh, John and Janie clean their room and John cleaned it better. Who gets two candies? There's three candies. Who gets two candies? Who gets one candy? John. Susie cleaned her room, or uh, Janie cleaned her room better. For the exam. Sorry, Janie cleaned her room better. Um, two candies. John gets one candy. Well, they both clean their room the same. Well, they get two candies each. Well, you don't. You only have three. They get one candy each. You have to give out all three candies. I'd like to keep the candy. The kid says typically, and then the experimenter, experimenter says, "No, you've got your own candy over here." three pieces of candy, decide who gets it. And they get kind of frustrated, the toddlers. And they say, I throw the third piece away. So it's not fairness in a very absolute sense that understands resource allocation and, and scarcity. It's really more of a justice informed sense of fairness, that it's about equality and um, trying to, to control the, the morality of the situation than it is making decisions about what's fair to on higher levels of group thinking. So uh, what actually affects all of these things? We know that there's certain uh, genetics. We know that we learn over time. We also know that uh, there are certain social affordances in our environment and certain cues that happen within our environment that encourage us to behave uh, differently and to grow differently. So we know that as we grow uh, language and race preferences, we don't see them with babies under two years of age. So uh, babies that are raised in a monolingual household that is just understanding one language uh, for the first couple of years do show a very clear preference for recordings of people speaking uh, their language as a, their native language as opposed to some other language. Uh, but you don't see that kind of preference uh, with babies that were raised in a multilingual household. Same thing with race. Uh, it's fascinating. Um, and so you can imagine what that does for implicit bias and, and different sorts of thinking uh, about groups as you get older. And it just reinforces itself through different learning and affiliation. That's who you form friends with. That's how you understand the world. That's how you make your, then eventually that's how you vote and raise your own children. So um, it starts with babies under two years of age, people who are going to be parents in the next 10 years. Um, experiments with adults, you know, it, it, we're a little less malleable as we get older, but you can override some of our basic cues. The first things that we categorize strangers on at a distance for all sorts of evolved reasons are uh, age, it's, I think it's uh, sex, age, sex, race, age, It, there's a certain order to it. It's sex. Is it sex? It's race, race, sex, age, I think, in that order. It's those are really the most salient things that people start instantly recognizing um, when you look at someone and then all sorts of other more individualistic details. But you can override those kinds of cues with uh, tribal cues, the things that I mentioned earlier, the reason why we watch what we watch and believe what we believe. So if you organize people uh, wearing generic clothing, people categorize them based on age and race and that sort of thing. Um, if you put team jerseys on them in an experimental setting, remember the game, Guess Who? Does anybody play with the little faces and stuff? So now if you change the question to say, are they wearing a blue jersey or a red jersey? It's a lot easier to start categorizing. And that ease, that cognitive ease is what motivates us to make a different level of decision. And also the tribal, the adaptive importance of understanding who's on whose team, that it doesn't really matter um, what someone's race is. Uh, you can see that in the modern Star Wars movies that uh, they, they code things less by race. The rebels used to be the only people who were racially diverse and the empire was mostly old white British sounding people. Um, the modern Star Wars movies, there's people of all sorts of ages and races on both sides of this uh, intergalactic political divide, but uh, the, the uniform tells you who you're rooting for and who you need to ally yourself with or against. 
So uh, team jerseys can actually override even our automatic decision making when it comes to categorizing people. So that's really uh, heartening, I think. So it's, it's a way to engage team spirit. The problem is there's always the other team, there's always the out group, but if we can leverage those, those in-group motivators to categorize people as similar to us in ways where we normally wouldn't, I think that's a really positive uh, consequence or potential for, for knowing this sort of research. Um, and uh, really, so Philip Zimbardo, we mentioned the prison experiment, I think it was last week, right? Media and violence or the week before. Um, we know that uh, he did a follow-up book. It's really good. Uh, you can take a look. Especially, it came out right after the Abu Ghraib prison scandal. So a timely uh, re-examination of what it is to put people in power over other people and to not really observe them and then come back and see what happens. Um, Zimbardo argues pretty persuasively that people, uh, that pretty much everyone is born as a good apple. There are no such thing as a, there's no such thing as a bad apple. There are good apples who get placed in bad barrels and uh, environments change us. This is supported by, is it Paul Bloom? Was that not? Was it not David Sloan Wilson? I think this might be Wilson. This might be a mistake in the slides. Wilson, I think, studies uh, good and bad neighborhood photos. So you can show there's that broken window philosophy that caused some over policing in some neighborhoods. But there's some uh, there's some experimental evidence that does demonstrate that you could tell someone you're about to play an economics game in the lab with someone. Uh, and all you have to do is vary the pictures of the neighborhood that they grew up in or where they currently live or whatever it is. And you can see how much more generous or not they are willing to be with that partner in subsequent games. Um, it's, uh, it's evidence of the fact that you might suddenly shift how you think. Let's say you lost your wallet you're in the middle of a downtown area that you think is unsafe in a city you've only visited once. And suddenly, you're, you might find that your moral values shift a little bit. You might uh, reconsider your environment as more hostile, and you might hop on the bus when you wouldn't dream of not having the dollar to give the person to ride the bus, but you might sneak on the bus this time, or whatever the example might be, however more serious it might get. Uh, the idea is that when you are threatened, when you're placed in an environment that does not give you a lot of social affordances or gives you social or cues, environmental cues that present this as a hostile environment, uh, people engage in less helpful ways. So it's not just uh, about whether or not you're a good apple, it's about the quality of the barrel in which you're placed. And so there's a lot of argument for improved uh, infrastructure and, and fixing a lot of socioeconomic disparities. Um, there's also evidence to show that you can be too wealthy and too comfortable. It's not just about having affordances. Uh, you can have too many affordances and uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but Wilson says, um, so yeah, it is Wilson. The last side, it wasn't blown, it was Wilson. Uh, Wilson also points out that uh, sometimes at the higher levels of social strata, you can trade your financial capital for social capital and you don't have to be nice uh, and ask someone, you don't have to have a friend with a truck to help you move. You can just pay a bunch of people to do the things that you need. And so there's a unique, there's a sweet spot and, and it's the traditional middle class that is evaporating um, that uh, when they tested people by leaving stamped return addressed envelopes on sidewalks and trying to figure out who's gonna put them in the mailbox. It's a traditional measure of, of pro-sociality in a behavioral community sense. I think it's really cool. Uh, that they, they brought them in the lab and asked them to play traditional economics games and looked at cooperative strategies. Uh, they observed neighborhoods to see who puts out decorations and leaves candy for the kids and that sort of thing. Uh, and then just ask traditional door-to-door -door surveys about values and helping other people and being a good neighbor. And they found that um, middle-class people have the unique position in, uh, in society of, of benefiting from intergroup exchange, um, 
while having enough resources to negotiate those boundaries and, and have uh, extra resources to trade back and forth and that sort of thing. So um, the, the, the garage sale and the swap meet and those sorts of things are the, the lifeblood of pro-sociality in a way, the, the ability to trick or treat in a neighborhood um, and, and feel like you belong in that community because there are decorations and whatever. So um, again, if it's about environment, just as much as what we're born with, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that if you score highly on the scale, you're gonna do lots of good things. It also doesn't mean that if you do lots of good things, you think or feel lots of good things. Um, we have all sorts of selfish reasons about why we do things. Um, it, I don't really care if people um, decide to be nicer. <laughs> because they get a tax break or because they think it's the right thing to do. I think the people who think it's the right thing to do deserve a tax break. And I think the people who chase it for a tax break uh, are allowed to feel like it's also a good thing that they did. There's, um, when you believe in a many to one relationship between moral intentions and moral results, which is very true. Otherwise, if your moral intention was to be as good as possible, you would not donate a uh, dollar to St. Jude, you would donate a dollar to uh, helping to buy a, a mosquito net to fight malaria in a third world country, and you don't do that. But objectively, that is a more effective use of your dollar in helping more living people right now. Um, all the sorts of criteria that we say we make these moral decisions for. So there are all sorts of reasons why we do good things. I, th I think the point is that when you put people in a good environment, like Michael said, in the good place, uh, people Im improve. When you give them social affordances, when they feel like they're respected and that their good deeds are reciprocated as well with love and support, um, people become better. Um, but at the same time, like I said, uh, there's, <laughs> there's all sorts of evidence that shows that good, good vibes, good feelings, uh, empathy isn't necessarily the right thing. Um, I mentioned the root of all cruelty was the other Atlantic piece here. It's how empathy makes people more violent. There's also uh, why building empathy is more important than ever. And to round it out, the Wired article, empathy is tearing us apart, as in, you're tearing me apart, Lisa as Johnny says in the very awful B movie, The Room. Um, empathy does all of those things. Empathy motivates us to, um, to help people and buy gifts and support each other in times of need. But Batson et al here, uh, there's an experiment that shows, you know, if you ask, uh, should, Susie be moved up on the organ transplant list because, because people say no. And then you show a picture and you say, well, this is little Susie. And you know where this is going because we've already talked about portrayals of women and the patriarchal chivalry that, that occurs that, you know, here's little Susie and um, she's only six years old and she sure would love that organ more than these other people. And her, her parents really love her. And the more pictures you show, the more narrative you provide, the more likely uh, the participants in the lab are going to develop empathy. And that empathy ends up correlating with their decision to allow Susie to jump the line. And every participant understands that the organ donor transplant list is already itself a criteria-based, priority-based self-sorting list um, that has its own ethics about it. So to claim that your morals override that system's ethics is uh, an, as a point of evidence that empathy is not always the answer. So Paul Bloom wrote a whole book arguing that empathy isn't great, especially if you think of empathy as uh, the literal uh, sympathetic feeling as those sort of mirror neurons I mentioned earlier. Um, if you looked at a stranger drowning on a lake and felt the choking sensation yourself, you might actually be so empathetic. And you can see this with infants and toddlers. Empathetic distress can be paralyzing and you can actually be so paralyzed that you don't help the person that you're empathizing with. 
Um, this happens when you feel too much for a cause and instead of donating, you turn off the TV or change the web page or something like that, click away from the ad. Um, that empathy isn't always, it, it might be the right direction, but it's not the complete answer for sure. Um, so if we know that people are malleable and they grow over time and that we're born with certain things, but they're kind of rudimentary, right? Um, and it's about developing environments where those things can stick over time. And we don't necessarily care if it's taxes or virtues, how they end up doing the right thing. Then as a media producer or a media consumer, you can start considering the types of things, that, the messages that you receive and, and identify with, and the types of messages and environments that you create. There's a really cute Volkswagen commercial where they put this staircase in the subway tunnel and they... Um, uh, they do a time lapse and they show that uh, instead of people traditionally taking the escalator, more people ended up taking the stairs when it was fun. And, and it also just shows them enjoying themselves. And how great is that? There's no reason to not uh, Ted Castronova here in uh, the media school uh, wrote a couple of books saying that exact premise that uh, if th there's going to be an exodus to the virtual world, if we don't um, start designing the real world to be more efficient, more considerate, more empowering uh, in ways that reflect the virtual world because we understand what good design is uh, and we can actually take some of those principles and make our real world systems better in the way that game design is a optimized system of human interaction. Um, Guy Grenzer uh, also makes this great argument that when it comes to something like taking the stairs or his argument is uh, organ donation. There's European countries that have the default, you know, here, right? You get a driver's license. They say, do you want to be an organ donor? Uh, and you have to opt in. Other countries have opt out. And so the default is that you are uh, choosing to be an organ donor and people recognize these sorts of social signals. Sometimes it's out of laziness and we just don't think like thinking about paperwork. And sometimes we don't, you know, we just, there's enough inertia, there's enough social capital to overcome. We know in our heads reflectively that other people probably aren't also opting out of this because it would take a lot of people. So the more the more it's assumed to be the default, the more people assume that other people are going to choose it as well. And the more it becomes the acceptable decision through that sort of reflective coordination. And you can invert the participation rates. Here it's 1090 and in other countries it's 90-10 as in 90% participating, 10% choosing to not be organ donors. Um, so the, uh, what are the design principles? If you're looking to design things, you know, there's those heuristics, like I mentioned, change the default, but you can also follow uh, what Desi and Ryan call self-determination theory. So sort of related, remember those three ethics of autonomy, community, divinity. Uh, similarly, there's sort of these self, uh, self-centered motivations, these self-determined things, these things that grant us agency and therefore enjoyment and satisfaction, fulfillment in life, uh, are autonomy, competency, and relatedness, things that empower us, things that make us feel smart or teach us, and things that make us feel connected to other people are things that we enjoy and things that motivate us. So have us do those things. Nintendo reminds us all the time, you should take a break. Netflix asks, hey, you still watching that? You want to go make dinner? TikTok asks, you know, are you sure you still want to watch this? Here uh, on the right is a great example of uh, a Pong-like video game that you play at either side of a crosswalk. And having the ability to play against the other person on the other side of the street uh, has demonstrably lowered the instances of jaywalking and not waiting for the cross signal to change. So um, you can see the label ActiWait. It's, uh, that's, oh, I get it now. That's cute. Oh my God. Um, that's just a little bit of a inserting play into our life. And it's, it's kind of gamification, but it's not gamification in the sense that it is incentivizing people to wait to cross the street. It, there's not points for the amount of time that you wait. It's simply offering alternatives and changing the it's reframing to go back to framing earlier it's changing the sense of space to be enjoyable in a different way instead of it being constraining uh, on your autonomy it's actually enhancing the relatedness um, although relatedness can go too far as we see you know facebook 
<laughs> that doesn't always ask often enough, um, did you know that Uncle Bob's post contains false information? So sometimes relatedness is the wrong thing to emphasize, but uh, what do we know in media psychology? That's what we're here to talk about. That's why presumably uh, you can take this class and you could be on a trajectory towards being a media effects researcher yourself. So what does the literature have to say? Well, Weaver and Lewis here in our own department in this building years ago, uh, they did a study uh, that they called mirrored morality, where they watched people play the first segment of Fallout 3, they recorded gameplay, they conducted a survey, and they found that uh, people's moral judgment uh, is actually similar to their real world frame. Like the, the things they said, uh, the dialogue choices they made and the decisions they chose in the game, largely similar to the, to the ways that they might respond in the real world. Uh, the general learning model, sort of the inverse, shows us that uh, through decades of traditional research on aggression and pro-social behavior, shows us that aggression uh, as attitudes, behaviors, beliefs, or pro-sociality, same thing. Uh, we end up learning these things through modeling, through uh, repetitive exercise, say in a video game context, and that we do develop those attitudes and beliefs over time that reflect the exposure and the exercise that we engage in. Um, the model of intuitive morality exemplars takes moral foundations theory, right? All those foundations, care, loyalty, purity, authority, uh, and says that the salience that we have, right? The soap opera thing, that the more we watch over time, the more the moral salience changes in line with the media. So we are what we eat, but also we make what we wanna eat. And so the things that media producers, their values are reflected in the media and whether or not uh, we make a certain decision about uh, whether or not we enjoy the media or the specific decision we make in a video game context might be uh, because of the certain priming that occurs in that environment about certain moral foundations. So uh, the takeaway is that morality is largely the same back and forth and between and inside all of these contexts. Real world, the video game, it translates kind of both ways. It's reflected both ways and that we do learn through time, uh, through exposure, to our social environment. And that includes, because of the media equation, that includes our media content consumption, like video games and film. Um, we also know that playing a little bit of video games can go a long way. So um, the type of game that you might play, if you play a pro-social game or an aggressive game, you can look at different measures, sort of like the pro-social scores, the Halloween decorations or survey. Here you can uh, survey people about their accessibility of pro-social thoughts and find that uh, this these things correlate in a positive direction such that the more pro-social game you play, uh, the more you're likely to help someone, uh, the more you're likely to volunteer, uh, but to participate in more research without compensation, which I mean, I know you're, you guys, you know, you want your two extra credit points and I get that. Um, helping with harassment. This is something, this was conducted in Germany and this is something we don't do here. You can't get away with this. Um, so if you see this, you're allowed, please say something. It's not part of the experiment, uh, but in Germany, they, uh, had a con they, they had the ethics board approve an experiment uh, where a Confederate uh, came in as the boyfriend of the lab researcher and started verbally and mildly, you know, grabbed her a little bit on the arm or something like physically abused the lab assistant. And uh, the people who played the pro-social game were more likely to intercede in those uh, in those fictional, those acted out scenarios versus the people who played the aggressive condition or even the neutral condition. They were just less likely to help with those things. Um, so um, yeah, social modeling, it's a thing. Uh, but we also know that you could even play on a separate, uh, you could play a competitive game and you're still likely to be more generous, even with someone on the opposing team from having played a game with them. So we know that there's also something not just about the style of play, but about play more generally, especially play with another human being that engenders a certain sense of helpfulness and ability to um, reinforce those norms of, of generalized reciprocity. So actually in our lab, I helped run an experiment where we had people play this video game Overcooked. We we're supposed to make a dish and you need to have multiple cooks and someone needs to chop and wash dishes. There's too much to do. The time the clock is ticking. Uh, and so you're helping each other and you can swap tasks, but you need everybody to sort of coordinate between the different tasks. Everything has a timer. Something needs so long to cook. 
so long to chop, but it also might start burning and that's on a timer. And uh, it's very hectic. It actually reminds me of really being in the kitchen and I don't like that sort of social stress. It really does mirror real life. And I, in real life, do not like this kind of coordination on that kind of time scale. But um, it's a great experimental measure and or a, um, um, intervention, I suppose. And so we use this and try to measure some dependent variables, including uh, outcomes of reciprocity norms, ability to actually help people with a non-video game post task. Uh, so we ask them to assemble these pentomino pieces into different square shapes that we had the solutions, you know, the people were playing in different rooms uh, from their teammate. And they were on average um, a little bit better with their communication pattern if they had played the game together than if they hadn't played the game together. Although they were best at the puzzle completion task in the mute condition. So that is, uh, they got to talk to solve the pentomino puzzles afterward, but if they had played Overcooked with a person, but they didn't have to chat with them, they were uh, presumably a little bit chattier and, and more helpful at completing the puzzles uh, afterward. So we also showed that a certain amount of social interaction is good, that one of the things that we can do by using video games or other environmental design to manipulate social environments in a way that modifies behavior is that we might wanna consider kind of like the point earlier about politics that more openness and communication isn't always a good thing. And that if we want people to be helpful in the long run over multiple tasks, maybe they don't need to chat all the time. So we learned presenting all these different theories from all these different perspectives um, that media production is an inherently moral practice uh, as, as pointed out by agenda setting and gatekeeping. We know that people use media to reinforce beliefs and bond with groups from all the lie is the point and the tribalism. We know that uh, from Jonathan Haidt and moral foundations theory that humans have this sort of universal system of judgment that gets shaped by culture and family and all sorts of different environmental factors. Um, and we know from effective disposition theory and communication research that audiences enjoy moral justice in their narratives, but they also appreciate some other stuff um, and they have different personality types. So maybe justice means different things to different people. Uh, we know from Paul Bloom and all of the different uh, infant studies and cognitive science that we looked at that we're pre-wired social beings, uh, but we definitely learn and adapt to our environments and things that happen to us as infants can affect how we act per, uh, potentially across our whole life or at least the trajectory. And that even later in life, our environments matter and that affordances and constraints can matter to community outcomes and behaviors much more than any individual's personality or situation. So, um, and from media design, media production, and especially a game design perspective, we should consider that if pro-sociality is more about behavior than intent, then design is definitely a solid path toward promoting societal good. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you.